Welcome to Biology 221, Introduction to Microbiology. My name is Teresa Rich and I'm going to be your instructor for this semester. I thought at the very beginning that I would give you some introductory material to the course as well as going over Chapter 1. For this course I expect you to do a lot of work outside of class. That will leave class time free for answering questions or going over topics that you may be struggling with, discussion of the material, and practicing critical thinking. Part of what I expect you to do before class is read the chapter. I would consult the study guide for the chapter before reading it, so you know what parts to study and what parts to skip. Then following the SQR3 method of studying, I would survey or skim the chapter. Next, I would find and learn the bolded items for the vocabulary list from the vocabulary list for the chapter. After you do this, it would be good to do the vocabulary practice or VP. The VP needs to be done before class. If you don't know the language, so to speak, you won't understand our discussion. Now you are ready to watch the PowerPoints I've constructed for this chapter. If you haven't skimmed the chapter or done the VP, I would go ahead and come back to this PowerPoint later. But if you are ready to go, um, I've constructed PowerPoints for each of the chapters recording my comments. After each PowerPoint, I have a quiz that goes over the chapter material and I would like you to take it so that I know that you've watched it. This is due before we discuss the chapter in class. Lastly, I want you to submit troublesome topics to me the day before class so that I know what to go over. All of these assignments chapter PowerPoints, VP, and troublesome topics can be found in Blackboard in assignments under this specific chapter. This course has a number of objectives that can be found in the syllabi for the lecture in the lab. At the beginning of each PowerPoint, I will let you know which objective this chapter fulfills. For chapter one, which you're viewing, uh, it fulfills objectives two and four. For objective number two, this chapter is giving you an introduction into microbiology. In other words, helping you comprehend the fundamentals of microbiology. We are starting you out easy. This chapter also covers objective number four, where you begin to get a basic understanding of the interactions and impact of microbes on humans in the environment. You didn't think they did, but they do. <laughs> At the beginning of each PowerPoint, I'll also go over the main topics we will be covering in the chapter. For this chapter, you'll notice I'm leaving a lot out, mostly the history of microbiology. You won't be tested over the material not covered, but it is interesting. Go ahead and read it if you like. Besides, I'll be bringing up the high points of the history of microbiology during the rest of the course, so you'll get it eventually anyway. So, for this chapter, we'll be talking about naming and classifying microorganisms, types of microorganisms, microbes in human welfare, and microbes in human disease. In this section, we will be discussing naming and classifying of microorganisms. First off, let's discuss what nomenclature means. It's the fancy dancy term for the science of naming things. So your first question in this section is probably going to be, why bother with all this Latin? It's hard enough to learn a new topic without learning all the Latin. That's true, but there is a very good reason for using Latin. Back during, eh, back during the medieval period in Europe, the scientific and intellectual communities used Latin to communicate. All of them had learned Latin as a second language during the Roman era, and it made sense to continue to use Latin. That way they could read each other's letters and publications without having to translate them first. Because of this, all living organisms are named in Latin. It benefits us in the same way that it benefited the medieval scientists. If I discover a new species of bacteria living in the intestines of sea slugs, it won't go through multiple names in each language. It will have just one name in Latin. Speaking of bacteria and intestines, let's get to know a bacterium that you will be spending a lot of quality time with this semester, E. coli. E. coli is a common inhabitant of mammalian intestines, including yours. Yeah, that's gross, but you will come to respect your little intestinal friends, even if you don't like the idea of them being in you. But first, let's discuss E. coli's name. E. coli is short for Escherichia coli. The first name, Escherichia, the first name, Escherichia, is the genus name. It's a bit like your family name. Coli is the species name. It's a bit like your personal name. Because both names are in Latin, they are always italicized to let you know it's not English. 
like you didn't know that already, but still. The genus name can be shortened to the first letter, which is how you're familiar with hearing Escherichia's coli's name as E. coli. Let's have a look at another microbe's name. You're probably familiar with this genus name, Sal Salmonella, having heard it it referred to in relation to not leaving the potato salad out for too long at picnics. So on an exam, if you saw these names or a different name in various formats, you would know which one to pick as the right answer, right? Hint, hint, hint. Now let's discuss the types of microorganisms. You're going to need to know this for the exam. As humans, we have a tendency to want to organize information. It helps us remember it, and it also helps us when we're trying to diagnose and treat diseases and uh, other such interesting things. Let's start with the prokaryotes. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. In Latin, karyo signifies the nucleus, so this is before nuclei or nucleuses if you don't use Latin and prokaryotes come in two types they come in bacteria and archaea now you can see from the picture that prokaryotes are fairly simple they don't have arms legs eyes etc they are always single-celled organisms and they reproduce asexually through binary division now some of them are capable of photosynthesis. In other words, if you look at them, they're green. Bacteria and archaea have differences. Before they were all lumped together under bacteria. But once we discovered these differences, then we had to create some new categories. Bacteria have peptidoglycan in their cell walls. Archaea do not. Something to remember. Now let's talk about eukaryotes. Eukaryotes have a nucleus. They have a tendency to be bigger. Let's talk about fungi. You're familiar with fungi. Fungi are your mushrooms and your yeast. You're familiar with both. You've probably had mushrooms on your pizzas, and if you've eaten bread or drunk alcohol or wine, beer, whatever, then you're familiar with yeast. Fungi come in both multicellular forms, the mushrooms, or single-celled forms, the yeast, and they can reproduce through asexual and sexual reproductions. They cannot photosynthesize. They have a substance called chitin in their cell walls. That helps distinguish them from the bacteria. Protozoa are a group that are currently under revision. But for this class, what you need to remember about protozoa is they have a nucleus, they're always single-celled, and they don't have a cell wall not a real cell wall anyway. They reproduce both sexually and asexually. Because they don't have cell walls, we don't need to worry about what's in their cell wall. Next are the algae. You're familiar with algae, also known as pond scum. They can come in single-celled, clear up to multicellular forms. You're probably most familiar with algae as kelp, seaweed, if you've had sushi, you've eaten seaweed. That is the multicellular form. Being eukaryotes, you meaning true, karyote meaning nucleus, they do have a nucleus, and they all photosynthesize. They also have cell walls. Their cell walls have cellulose. You're probably familiar with that one because plants also have cellulose in their cell walls. Plants are related to algae. And lastly, in the eukaryotes that you will be dealing with in this class, multicellular parasites, also known as worms. Now, you're probably wondering, why do we include worms in microorganisms? They're big. We can see them with our eyes. Well, when treating worm infestations, one of the tests that we do is to look under a microscope for the larva or the eggs. That's why it puts it in the realm of microbiology. Now for our last group. Let's talk about viruses. Viruses are not composed of cells. Both the prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, eukaryotes, fungi, protozoa, algae, and animals, worms, are all composed of cells. Viruses are not. They are acellular. This picture here shows a human white blood cell that's being attacked by nasty HIV viruses. Those are the ones in red. 
Viruses are composed of genetic material. It can be either RNA or DNA. We're going to learn more about those terms as we go along, but I want you to have heard the terms so that you recognize them again later. Viruses have genetic material and they have kind of a spaceship of protein protecting the genetic material. Some viruses have a cell membrane, we call it an envelope, around the outside beyond that. Um, some do not. So it's enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. Now I will warn you right now, I like viruses. I don't like getting them. But they're interesting to study and that's m what the focus of my graduate work was. So you're going to be hearing a lot about the viruses. Uh, there's a debate going on about whether viruses are alive or not. Personally coming from the biology side, I say they're alive. They get into cells, they take over, and they make more of themselves, they reproduce, and then they leave the cell dead or dying behind. Others say that they are biologically active molecules. Eh, I can see their point. They don't grow and they are not metabolically active outside of a cell. So I can see their point. Now it is good to be able to learn all of the characteristics that separate these groups because I can guarantee you they're going to show up on the test. Now that you've learned something about these different microbes and different types of microbes, let's talk about how they benefit us. Microbes are vital in recycling vital nutrients. You're going, eh, vital nutrients, what do you mean? Well, if it wasn't for microbes, all of the leaves that come down in the fall, if there wasn't somebody to uh, sweep them up, rake them up, they would end up in the landfills unbroken down. All of that carbon trapped in the leaves would stay trapped in the leaves and we would be swimming through leaves. It's a good thing not to have carbon locked up in dead bodies. Also, microbes are vital in the nitrogen cycle. You're going, what do I need nitrogen for? Well, you're going to learn in the next chapter. But bacteria, specifically, are the only organisms that we know of who can fix nitrogen. Okay, We'll learn more about that term, but remember, bacteria fix nitrogen. Okay, sewage treatment. It's another ooh factor, but you really don't want to be drinking somebody else's sewage. In the United States and in other industrialized countries, we treat our wastewater before we dump them back into the streams, rivers, oceans. That's a good thing. We have a lot of microbes that help us in this process. We filter out the big solid stuff, then microbes break down other stuff, and then we remove those microbes pretty much and before we dump them back into the communal water supply. Bioremediation. This is a fancy word for, for example, cleaning up oil spills. With the Gulf oil spill that we had just recently, that eclipsed the previously bad oil spill that we had when the Exxon Valdez uh, ran aground off of the Alaska coast. We've got microbes that can go in and just love to eat oil. It speeds up the recycling of the carbon in the oil, releases it back into the environment so that other organisms can use them. This speeds up the process that would normally take you know, tens if not thousands of years. It's a good thing. Insect pest control. There's a type of bacterium in the bacillus family that produces a toxin that will, when eaten by insect larvae, for example our lovely butterfly off to the right there, that when they eat that, the toxin turns into the molecular equivalent of little shards of glass, cuts them up on the inside and they die. You're thinking, why in the world would we want this? Well, if you're a farmer and you have caterpillar pests, then you don't want them eating your crops. Your profit margin is small enough as it is, and so Previously, they would take the toxin that was produced by this bacillus species and they would spray it onto their crops, which brings me to the next thing. Nowadays, we can take the gene from the bacterium, put it into the crop plants so that they produce their own Bt toxin, so that they are resistant to these caterpillars. Now, you're probably thinking, I don't want to eat little shards of glass. Well, in mammal intestines, 
that molecular process doesn't happen. It only happens in insect guts, which is a good thing. Another thing with modern biotechnology and recombinant DNA technology, we can take human genes, put them into bacteria or yeast, and get them to make products that we need. For example, diabetics. Some of them are insulin dependent. Their pancreas no longer makes insulin. They've got to have insulin otherwise their lifespan is going to be short. So back in the bad old days we used to get insulin from pig pancreases. Pigs are constantly being slaughtered. We'd take the pancreases, grind them up, extract the insulin, and then the patient could inject them. Well eventually you become allergic to the other pig proteins. So then you have to switch to beef insulin. Then from there you have to switch to horse insulin. Well nowadays we can take human insulin gene, put it into E. coli, which you've already got in your gut. You're not allergic to it. Have them make a ton of insulin. We're giving diabetic patients human insulin, which is pretty cool. Now that we've learned about the good things that microbes can do, let's talk about microbes and their relationship to human disease. First, let's talk about your normal microbiota. Your normal microbiota are your friends. You are covered inside and out with bacteria, yeast, archaea, and eh, some of us have worms that are not doing any harm in our intestines. All of this is considered, well except for the worms, are considered your normal microbiota. As we go along through the course we're going to be talking about the normal microbiota and how it benefits us as we go along. Let's talk about biofilms now. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's talk about the good first. But biofilms, what are they? Biofilms are community of microbes. Any time you have more than one microbe growing together in a mass that we can see, it's considered a biofilm. This is the normal state of microbes in the environment. So the good. Good micro biofilms are found in the environment. Say you're studying stream ecology. You're going to have biofilms of microbes living on the rocks, grains of sand, etc. And this provides the foundation of the food chain. They're providing food for other microbes, other microbes, fish, insects, you name it. And more than likely some of them are photosynthesizing and fixing nitrogen. This is a good thing. Now on to the bad. On the surface of your teeth you have lots of bacteria. If they grow to the point where we can physically see it, we call this plaque. This is a biofilm. If you leave it on for long enough, if you're not brushing your teeth at least daily, twice a day is even better, then you get diseases that we call cavities. If you're a dentist, we call this caries. And periodontal diseases, where your gums become inflamed and pull away from your teeth, and if it goes on long enough, your teeth fall out. That's why we brush our teeth. We're busting up this biofilm and we're um, letting them grow again, but not letting them get to the point where they cause disease. Now on to the ugly. Most of the skin bacteria isolated from human skin is called Staphylococcus epidermidis. Now it's all fine and good to have it on your skin, but if it gets where it doesn't belong, it can cause disease. Say for example I'm having a knee replacement and the surgical staff were not careful enough about disinfecting the incision sites or weren't wearing sterile gloves. You can get staph epi inside on that artificial knee joint. They form biofilms that are notoriously hard to get rid of with antibiotics. We don't want staph epi in the system. Okay. Oftentimes they have to remove the artificial joint and start again. This is not good. This is also why, if you're going into a health profession, we make you take this class so you can learn the importance of controlling microbes in the environment, particularly in the hospital environment. Now let's talk about infectious disease. There's two basic kinds that we're going to be talking about repeatedly, endemic and emerging. Endemic is a disease that is common in the population and you have a tendency to to be expecting it. Examples in the US of endemic diseases are influenza, 
the common cold, those sorts of things. Emerging diseases are diseases that we either haven't been familiar with or they're moving from one place to another. An example of an emerging disease would be um, West Nile virus. We didn't have it in the United States until about four years ago. Came over from the Mediterranean, got here, and now it's becoming endemic. It's here to stay. Well, that's about it for chapter two, uh, chapter one, excuse me, I'm skipping ahead to the infamous chapter two. In summary, microbes are divided first as being prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Remember that prokaryotic means they don't have a nucleus, eukaryotic means that they do have a nucleus. Prokaryotic cells are either bacteria or archaea. Eukaryotic microbes are either fungi, protozoa, or algae. Microbes are vital in preserving Earth preserving life on Earth in that they recycle nutrients, they fix nitrogen, they photosynthesize, and some microbes cause disease. Just a reminder, you must be registered for and attending a Biology 221 lab. If you are not, do so now or you will be dropped from the course. Alright, that's it for today and good luck on learning Chapter 1.